Good evening. Thank you to all the participants for joining us today. I'm Andrea Coyne, Manager of Elections at the Town of Oakville, and with me tonight is Vicki Titanic, Town Clerk. Today's information session is geared towards registered candidates or those thinking about registering as a candidate for Office of Mayor, Councillor, Regional Chair, or School Board Trustee. Whether or not you have made up your mind about running for an elected position, we hope this session will provide useful takeaways to help you in whichever path you choose. Your interest in this session shows you're actively engaged in your community, and I applaud you for that. Municipal and regional governments are closely connected with and impact residents, businesses, and organizations. Oakville as we know it today is rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations, Inuit and Métis, from the lands of the Anishinaabe to the Adnawandaran and the Haudenosaunee. These lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in First Nations history. The town of Oakville is located on Treaty 14 and Treaty 22 lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the treaty holders for being stewards of this traditional territory. Before we begin, a few housekeeping items. Please ensure that your Zoom name is the name that you registered with. Unknown, anonymous, or inappropriate generic usernames will not be granted permission to speak. After our guest speaker's presentation, we will take a couple of questions. To ask a question, please use the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen and the host will unmute yourself. If you have a general question pertaining to election campaigns, there will be a Q&A period following the presentation from the ministry. Throughout the presentation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to type out the question. Please also note that this meeting is being recorded. If you're having technical difficulties at any time during the session, please email townclerk at oakville.ca for assistance. Nominations will be accepted until 2 p.m. on Friday, August 19th. Please visit the town's election website for complete details and what's required to file. Appointments are required to file and candidates for office on council will be required to provide at least 25 endorsements from eligible voters. A reminder that individuals must not accept contributions for election purposes or incur expenses until nomination papers have been filed. Myself, Vicki Titanic, the town clerk, and the entire election team is here to support each and every one of you. Please reach out with any concerns, feedback, or questions you may have. Our contact information is available on the town's elections website, and I can be reached directly by phone or email. And for those elected, the town has approved a COVID-19 vaccination procedure for members of council. And now I am absolutely pleased to introduce our guest speaker for tonight's session. Bernadette Clement was appointed to the Senate in 2021. She was elected mayor of Cornwall in 2018, becoming the city's first female mayor and the first black woman to serve as mayor in Ontario. Prior to this, she served three terms as city councilor. She is very proud of her Francophone and Trinidadian heritage, reflecting both Canada's diversity as well as its linguistic duality. Professionally, she is a legal aid lawyer focused on representing injured workers. She has volunteered extensively in her community, advocating on racial equity and working to support newcomers, people with disabilities, and the homeless. She continues to mentor aspiring community leaders. Senator Clement, I am pleased to virtually welcome you to Oakville. Thank you very much. Thank you, first of all, for this invitation. I'm, uh, I'm thrilled. Thank you to the town of Oakville and uh, to all the staff who are organizing all of these events to support candidates. I uh, am speaking to you from my home office in my home community, the city of Cornwall, which is located on the traditional territory of the Mohawk people of Akwesasne. So I um, never thought that I would become a politician. I went to law school and I became a legal clinic lawyer because I wanted to help people, um, because I felt that I wanted to be useful to people uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis and um, didn't grow up in Cornwall. So I grew up in Montreal. My father is from Trinidad and Tobago. My mother is Franco-Manitoban. 
And uh, I was born and raised in Montreal. But when I went to law school at the University of Ottawa, um, I chose to become an Ontarian and a Franco-Ontarian uh, when I moved to Cornwall. And I spent many, many years as a legal aid lawyer before even thinking about politics. I didn't see anybody that looked like me in those roles. I don't come from a family of politicians. So it never occurred to me that it would be something that I could do, uh, something that could be interesting or um, as something that I would could enjoy. And it wasn't until about 2006 when our local pulp and paper mill closed here in Cornwall. And I wondered about how our community would survive the closure of this industry that had defined our city for decades and decades. And when I looked around the city council table to see who would lead us through that difficult time, there were no women around the council table at that time. And I thought to myself, well, that doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. How are we going to come up with solutions if we don't have, you know, a diversity of voices around the table? And still, I didn't think to run. People had to ask me to do so. And we often say that um, some women need to be asked before they make that decision to run. They need to feel like they check all the qualification boxes before they feel that they can do this. But I think that somebody who loves where they live, somebody who's done community work, um, who's volunteered, who's raising kids, who helps their neighbors, all of these things are qualifications that make you um, quite suited to city council work. So in 2006, I ran along with several other women that year. And we would get together at the Tim Hortons, uh, several Tim Hortons locally, and compare notes. And whenever our male colleagues would show up, they'd say, but how come you're talking to each other? I mean, you're running against each other. But as women, uh, especially those of us running for the first time back in 2006, we felt that it was helpful to compare notes. Um, so we did that regularly. And several women were elected in 2006. Um, so I uh, spent three terms on city council and loved every minute of it. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. What I'm saying is that it's so enriching. You really, really feel the honor and the privilege um, when you're elected to represent people, in, people of your community. They um, tell you what they need. They tell you what their vision is, what their hopes and dreams are, and it's um, it's it's a great honor to to represent people and to be able to take those hopes and dreams and concerns uh, into decision making and planning for your community. So, as hard as it can be at times, it, it's definitely some of the most satisfying work um, that I've ever done. As a legal aid or lawyer, I was helping one person at a time. As a city councillor. I was able to make decisions that impacted the recreation budget, um, that made programs available for um, kids who couldn't always afford to access certain programs. I was able to contribute to the building of a three pad arena. I was able to contribute to the building and planning of our wastewater treatment plant. Now I know that doesn't sound like the sexiest topic, but I love wastewater treatment. Um, it's actually a very important piece about how you're a good steward to the environment, a good steward to the St. Lawrence River, um, and uh, it's uh, a key to um, reusing energy and finding ways to make sure that our community is sustainable. One of, one of my favorite projects ever, and one of the biggest ones for the city of Cornwall was our wastewater treatment plant. So when you are a city councillor, you're building and you're contributing in ways that are so um, directly um, impacting people. One of the, um, I think, most important decisions I was ever a part of around our council table was in uh, making a large donation to our local hospice. So this hospice has now been in our community for many years, um, delivering what you know we consider to be um, an absolutely essential service uh, for families and residents in our community. And the fact that I voted to make sure that there was money going to that to kickstart um, 
a, a fundraising campaign that actually got it built is still one of my most um, most important projects that I ever was able to participate in um, as a city councillor, and in fact, in my in my career. After three terms on city council, uh, I was ready to run for mayor. Uh, again, it took me a long time to consider myself ready. I just, again, had never seen somebody that looked like me in the role. Um, and I guess I needed to feel confident and supported. And when I met with some asylum seekers, so Cornwall was um, the site that welcomed 300 Haitian asylum seekers back in 2017, temporarily housed here in our city. I was the deputy, or not the deputy, the interim uh, acting mayor at the time. So I, I went in to, to replace the mayor to welcome them. And they came to me after the, the, the greeting and they said, the mayor of this town looks like us. And that surprised them. And I realized that there's a message of welcome that, um, that I could provide as mayor. And so even though I'm not born in Cornwall, I said, you know what, let me, let me try this. And throughout the campaign for mayor, I was, I was counseled not to talk about the fact that I could become the city's first woman mayor or the first uh, black woman mayor in Ontario. I was counseled not to talk about those things. And I didn't actually. I spoke about taxes and um, recreation programs and snow removal and sidewalks and road repair, all the very traditional municipal issues. And the night of the election, the media showed up, right, and saying, hey, Cornwall just elected their first woman mayor and Cornwall just elected the first black woman mayor in Ontario. And people in Cornwall just sort of thought, well, well, we elected Bernadette, right? So municipal councillors, um, mayors are um, very directly connected to the people of their communities. Uh, you approach us in grocery stores. Um, we chat with you whenever we're out at restaurants or at in the park. And we love to do that because the more that we chat with you, uh, the better we are at our jobs because we have an understanding of what's needed for our communities. Um, it just uh, didn't occur to me that my running and that my being elected would would be would be important on different levels. I remember a little girl who helped me out during the campaign. Her name was Jersey. She was um, the little sister of a friend. And she was sitting in the back seat of the car, you know, helping to um, put up signs and help me with door knocking. And she tugged on my hair from the back seat of the car. And she said, one day I'm gonna run for mayor too. So Jersey looks like me. She has brown skin and, and curly hair. And in that moment, I understood that when you're running for mayor for city council, of course you're running for all of the people that you're going to represent. But for some people, little girls, little boys, uh, little girls of color, little black girls, women, um, it would have a special significance um, because representation does matter. And I've also found that when you have a council that has some diversity, younger, older um, parents, um, retired, uh, like all kinds of different people, um, black, white, Asian, it, you just have different conversations, different solutions to problems because everybody's bringing perspectives that are different. And then you have deeper um, solutions to, you know, an increasingly complex world that we live in. So I was elected mayor in 2018 and then um, the pandemic hit. Ooh. So that was tough. Um, it's been a tough couple of years. But again, I think that people turned uh, most especially to their city councils for information, for reassurance, for connection. And um, again, it was an honor, an honor to be in that role during a time when people were feeling worried and um, disconnected from each other. 
and again, some of um, the most significant work I think I will ever do in my life was during that pandemic, uh, making sure that people remained connected to their services, their municipal services, and to and to each other. Um, and then in 2021, I was appointed to the Senate. So you cannot be uh, a senator and an elected person at the same time. So when I got the call from the prime minister, I had to resign immediately as mayor. And I, I hesitated before um, applying for that job because I so loved being the mayor. Uh, but, you know, it seemed like the timing was interesting. So I applied, not thinking that I would get the call. And, and when you're appointed to the, to the Senate, the prime minister calls personally to offer the job. And they don't tell you that he's going to call. They sort of just say, be available for a call. And then it, it, it came on a Friday afternoon at 4.30. And when he asked me how I felt about, you know, being appointed to the Senate, my first reaction was to say, well, I feel a bit sad. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, I'll have to immediately resign uh, from um, the mayor's seat uh, in order to, to become a senator. And he said, oh, I understand. I understand that. Again, because municipal work is, is really work that connects you in such a direct way to community. I can't, I can't um, recommend it enough to people. It's an interesting career if you're ever going to work for a municipality, and I'm sure that, you know, the town staff will tell you that, that the opportunity to work for your city and to build things and to manage your city is a great opportunity. Um, and to be elected to represent people uh, on a city council is also uh, a tremendous honor that um, that connects you in ways that um, that almost no other work can do. So if you're thinking about it, um, keep thinking about it. Don't hesitate to reach out to me if, if you want to ask me anything. If you want to ask anything in this session, I will be um, truthful and honest about uh, the barriers and some of the challenges. Um, but I'm always going to tell you that. Um, it was worth it. It's worth it. It's worth all the work and the challenges. There is nothing more um, more connecting to community. Uh, the other advice I would give you is uh, if you're going to do it, if you've registered, especially in the first time you're running, it's great. You don't have baggage. You're running on the basis of why you want to run, that you love where you live. And it's okay to use the word love in politics, by the way. You can do that. Um, because loving your neighbors, loving your family, loving where you live is a very important part of how you communicate why you're running and how you communicate that you really want the job, especially that first time that you run. Uh, and running against incumbents can be hard, but when you're a fresh face, that's great. That's also great. People uh, instinctively, electors instinctively look to try and put in a mix of people because we have an understanding that, again, diversity brings um, complex solutions to complex problems. So that's, um, that's what I have to offer uh, today to uh, the town of Oakville and can take questions and look forward to hearing from the municipal reps as well in terms of how to technically um, do well in the campaign. Thank you so much, Senator Clement. Uh, such an insightful and thoughtful presentation. I recall you speaking to how municipal councils fix things at the community level, recognizing the real difference they make in two communities, um, and that couldn't be more true. Uh, I thank you so much for taking the time to help engage, inform, and motivate those interested in making a difference. Um, I don't see any hands or questions at the moment, um, but should anyone have any questions, please use the re raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or you can type questions in the chat section. Um, Senator Clement is staying on with us during the ministry's presentation. Should anyone wish to ask a question, we can address it after as well. Um, so again, thank you so much, Senator Clement, for participating in our candidate session this evening. Your story, your motivation, and your encouragement to all is absolutely inspiring.
Um, I'm now very pleased to welcome Diane Ploss and Bridget Foster from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to present on election campaign details, campaign finance information, roles and responsibilities, and more. And Diane and Bridget, the floor is yours, and I'll share your uh, slide deck in just a moment. Diane, sorry, you're muted. I'm gonna start that again. Senator Clement, I, I wanna pack you up and put you in my pocket and take you to every municipal presentation I ever have to do. You are inspiring. I love what drove you to do your municipal job. And um, I understand the difficulty in making the decision, but um, you're now going to spread that wonderful um, caring and love to another level of government. And I thank you for that. Okay, so we will get started. My name is Diane Ploss and I'm from the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I am the municipal advisor covering Muskoka, Niagara and Hamilton. Uh, attending with me today is my colleague, Bridget Foster. Bridget can come on with her, uh, her, her face. Um, Bridget is our senior municipal advisor and today we're going to be taking turns uh, presenting the deck for you. Uh, I would like to thank um, the Town of Oakville and staff for supporting us uh, through this presentation and inviting us and I also want to congratulate um, the members of the people, members from the community who are uh, taking an interest in their local government. Next slide please. Uh, this slide is um, meant to just indicate to you that we have taken a great deal of information and put it into, uh, you know, a number of slides to present to you. Um, we want to say that it is a summary of legislation that you should not rely on it for legal or official purposes. We would encourage you to look directly at the legislation and certainly some of the other tools that we have made available, including the candidate's guide, the voter's guide, and the third party advertising guides, as well as the regulation election forms that are on the government website. At the end of the presentation, we have um, listed and provided links to those pieces of information. So if you want to continue to follow up, um, we hope this session will provide you a better understanding of the process and the legislation and improve your comfort level in what you're about to do. If you have any questions regarding the topics included in this presentation, at the back of this deck, we have indicated uh, Verity Martin's name. She is actually the municipal advisor who covers Oakville. She's on vacation today. Um, again, we are going to ask you to keep your questions till the end, but I would encourage you if you want to jot them down or type them into the chat, um, that's a way in order to remember what it was you wanted to ask. Um, some of the slides are very high level and, can, and some of the slides are a very deep dive. So again, uh, we would recommend you going back to some resources. Uh, next slide, please. So at the end, again, I've mentioned we are gonna do a Q&A. Uh, we will be able to answer questions that are included in the deck in the, um, the candidate's guide. Um, if you get too specific, we may not be able to answer your question um, in a specific fashion, but we will be able to give you general information and guide you to pieces of legislation that might help. Um, one of the things uh, that I would mention to you is the legislation does not address election signs. That's something that your municipality will be able to chat with you about. Next slide, please. Running for municipal office. Local government is the level of government that is closest to the people and is the most accessible and responsive to the needs of the community. 
You have to remember that if elected, it is a four year commitment. Ontario's municipal governments deliver, deliver local services while the province establishes legislative frameworks for municipalities which seek to balance local autonomy and flexibility with accountability and transparency of municipal operations. The Ontario government sets standards for many local services such as land use planning, building regulation and social housing and the province often provides funding to the municipalities to deliver some of these services. Uh, before we get an overview of the Municipal Elections Act, we want to provide a little bit of a summary of municipal roles. Next slide. Let me start by saying the Municipal Act stipulates that municipalities are created by the province to be responsible and accountable governments with respect to the matters within their jurisdiction. Legislation such as the Municipal Act and the Planning Act, etc., set out what is that municipal jurisdiction. To reinforce, each municipality is given powers and duties under the Municipal Act and other pieces of legislation for the purpose of providing good government. The next few slides will briefly illustrate the role of the mayor the mayor's role as chief executive officer, the role of council and the role of municipal staff. Next slide, please. Role of council. Government is not like other businesses. You should be very prepared for differing roles and differing, uh, differing directions. Council has many roles, including maintaining the financial integrity of the municipality, ensuring the accountability and transparency of the operations of the municipality, and determining which services the municipality provides. Below, um, I'm just going to read to you an example of some of the acts that you will need to understand your role should you be elected. Certainly the Municipal Act, the Planning Act, the Municipal Elections Act, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, the Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, and another one that you've had to be very familiar with through the pandemic is the Health Promotion and Protection Act. Next slide, please. Role of Council continued. It's important to remember that decisions of council are made as a collective group with all members of council, including the mayor and the deputy mayor, only having one vote. The affirmative or majority outcome becomes the strategic direction for staff. Refraining or abstaining from a vote actually creates a no vote. A tie vote results in a no or a turn down of the matter being voted on. There's some confusion on the point that the head of council can only vote in the case of a tie. The mayor or the head of council should be voting on every matter. To reinforce the direction, uh, to reinforce the direction of mun the municipality is not decided by one person. All members of council have one vote and the affirmative outcome becomes the strategic direction. The Municipal Act sets out many of these responsibilities and limitations for the municipality, um, and some of those are included on this particular slide. Next slide, please. The role of the head of council. The role of the head of council is to act as a leader. He or she represent the municipality at official functions, preside over council meetings so that the business can be carried out efficiently and effectively and provide leadership to council. Next slide, please. The role of the head of council continued. Although the legislation refers to the head of council as the chief executive officer of the municipality, this may be very confusing to people with a business background. The head of council has very few powers that can be exercised independently of the rest of council. There are exceptions, 
where pieces of legislation specifically de uh, delegate in cases of emergency or other um, situations where the head of council does have decision, sole decision-making power. Some examples of those legislations that give the head of council differing powers includes the um, Municipal Freedom of Information Protection of Privacy Act and the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. Next slide, please. Staff role. A key feature of efficient and effective councils is a well-developed understanding of the council staff relation and the role each of them play. Municipalities are required to have a policy on council staff relations. The role of staff is set out in the Municipal Act. This would include implementing council's decisions and establishing administrative practices and procedures to carry out council's decisions undertaking research and providing advice to council on policies and programs for the municipality, and carrying out duties required by legislation or other duties assigned by the municipality. There are some municipal staff positions that have statutory or legislative obligations. That includes the clerk, the treasurer, the chief building official, and the fire chief. And it is really important that council realize that they are unable to interfere with those statutory or legis legislated obligations of those particular positions. Next slide, please. The role of the chief administrative officer. The function of the CAO is similar to the role of a chief executive officer in the business environment. The CAO is responsible for the general control and management of the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality, which may include developing and implementing appropriate internal administrative practices and procedures to ensure the efficient, effective, and accountable operations of the municipality. To help you understand this role, I'm gonna to try to paint you a picture. I want you to think about an hourglass and you think about the shape of an hourglass being larger at the top and larger at the bottom. And then there's a very narrow section in the middle. Council is at one end and municipal staff and department heads are at the other, those two large ends. The CAO is the narrow part in the middle. Decisions of council provide direction to staff and need to flow through the CAO so they're aware of and can monitor the progress of these directions. Information and reports from staff to council also need to flow through the CAO as part of that monitoring. The CAOs, this CAO model supports efficient and effective um, actions for the municipality. And I am going to comment that each municipality would alter this model slightly to support local needs and local wants. But I just thought it was a really good one to paint that picture. Next slide. Council staff relationship. relationship. The bottom of this slide is one of my favorite slides in this whole deck because it shows, um, and for talking about council staff relations, it's very simple and very clear. Council is a representative for the municipality. They provide direction and policy to staff. They make decisions, usually in the form of a bylaw at a council meeting and they are the political leadership for the municipality. The CAO and staff manage people and resources of the municipality. They provide research and advice to council. They implement council's decisions and they provide organizational leadership. Next slide, please. The representative role. In the next few slides, I will provide a bit more information on how each of the each of the roles of council, as described in um, as described in the councillor's guide, 
are, are implemented. So for example, first, council is a representative. They have a representative role. And in that role as a representative, um, you are elected by your constituents to represent their views when dealing with issues, as well as making decisions for the overall good of the municipality. For many issues, you will have to consider a variety of opposing interests and make decisions that may not be popular. popular. You should also use your judgment and decide based on the best overall interests for the municipality. Next slide, please. Policy making. The policy in this in this slide, the slide outlines the general process undertaken during the policy making role. Some of Council's decisions are routine. Others establish general principles that help guide future actions. And then there are some pol or then there are policies that can be very specific, such as a bylaw requiring dogs to be kept on a leash in public areas or other policies that are required under the Municipal Act, and others that can be very broad or more general, such as, an appro the, such as approval of an official plan. Next slide, please. Stewardship role. The stewardship role is another important role for council, and it is to ensure that the municipality's financial and administrative resources are being used as effectively as possible. And I would suggest that you can probably familiarize yourself more with these three slides. There was a little bit more detail on each um, following, following the presentation. Next slide, please. Accountability and transparency. This slide outlines the policies that councils are required to adopt to support that framework of accountability and transparency. Ontario municipalities and members of councils operate under a legislated accountability and transparency framework that is not optional and includes rules for the municipalities, rules for members of council, committees, and local boards. Accountability and transparency of elected officials is important to create and maintain public trust. Councillors are, of course, accountable to the public as elected officials. However, it's also important that procedures and policies are clearly set out and accessible and that the day-to-day -day operations of the municipality are transparent to your ratepayers. Next slide, please. Code of conduct. Every municipality must have a code of conduct that usually sets out expectations and standards for counselor conduct. Codes may help prevent ethical conflicts, serve as a reference throughout the operations of the whole council term. Municipalities are required to establish codes of conduct for members of council and for certain local boards. And these are supposed to give direction related to gifts, benefit and benefits and hospitality, respectful conduct, including towards officers and employees of the municipality or of the local board, with regard to confidential information, and the use of municipal or local property and equipment. Next slide, please. Accountability officers. Municipalities can have a variety of accountability officers as part of their accountability and transparency framework. A closed meeting investigator and an integrity commissioner are mandatory, while an auditor general, a lobby, lobby registry or registra registrar, and a municipal ombudsman are available for the municipal to appoint and optional. An integrity commissioner operates independent of council and reports to council, council with respect to procedures, rules, and policies governing the ethical behavior of members of council and local boards. The application of a code of conduct of members and council and local boards is something that the integrity commissioner has a deep understanding and involvement in. 
Next slide, please. The Ontario Ombudsman has a role with respect to municipalities. This role builds on the local and accountability uh, local accountability and transparency framework, but is outside of the municipal jurisdiction. For more information, you can read directly through this slide. Next slide, please. Privacy and confidentiality. Personal privacy and other confidentiality issues are impo important practical and legal considerations for municipal councillors and staff. Breaches of privacy and or confidentiality can lead to litigation that could be very damaging to the municipal reputation, ratepayer trust, and have significant financial impacts. The Municipal Freedom of Information and Protection of Privacy Act, or as we call it because we like acronyms, MFIPA, is the primary statute for privacy and confidentiality. It sets out rules for collection, use, and disclosure of private information. So at this point, we are going to go from talking a little bit about the municipal roles. We're going to now move into the campaigning, into the election campaigning. Next slide, thank you. The role of the school board trustee. Um, the Education Act creates four different kinds of school boards. English language public district school board, English language separate district school board, French language public district school board, and French language separate district school board. School trustees are members of the school board. They are locally elected representatives of the public and they are the community's advocate for education. Like municipal councils, only the board, not an individual trustee, has the authority to make a decision or take action. A trustee is often the first point of contact for parents and community members who have questions and or concerns about their local schools. Candidates should contact the applicable school board for further information about duties and commitments. Next slide, please. The role of a school board trustee is to establish policy direction, participate in making decisions that benefit the entire school board while representing interests, the, the interests of constituents. School board trustees are accountable to constituents, the ministries of education, and to families. Next slide, please. The next three slides outline the eligibility and ineligibility requirements for school board, municipal, and third party advertising uh, nominations. So to run for a trustee position, you must be an el eligible elector, which means you must be able to vote. An important note, um, as it is different from a municipal candidate, if you are an employee of any school board, and you wish to run for a trustee position on any school board in the province, you must take an unpaid leave of absence before you file your nomination form. If elected, you must resign from your job. You cannot work for a school board and be a trustee in Ontario at the same time. Questions about school board eligibility should be directed to the secretary of the school board, which is usually the director of education. Next slide, please. Municipal office eligibility and ineligibility. In order to run for office for a municipality, you must be an eligible elector, which means you must be able to vote. This list on this slide shows both voter eligibility as well as ineligibility to run and hold office. You can only be nominated if as of the day you are nominated, you are qualified to hold that office and are not ineligible under the Municipal Elections Act or any other, any, any other act or otherwise prohibited by law from being nominated for the office. If a municipal employee wishes to run for an office on that municipal council, they must take a leave of absence before filing their nomination form. 
If elected, he or she shall be deemed to have resigned from the, their employment immediately before making the declaration of office. You notice that was a little bit different from the school board. Um, a municipal employee just has to take the leave of absence if they are running in their municipality, not any municipality. So that's the small difference between the two. Recent changes to the Municipal Elections Act states that a volunteer fighter, a firefighter, excuse me, as defined on the fire, under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, shall not be considered an employee. In previous years, they were on, they were fault, they were um, under the rules that I've just explained to you. They are no longer. They can, um, they do not have to take a leave of absence. If an employee of a municipality wants to run for an office in a different municipality, they don't have to take a leave of absence or resign, but they should check with their employer as their employer may have specific policies that will affect them. Next slide, please. Third party advertisers. Only the following persons or entities are eligible to file a notice of registration. An individual who normally resides in Ontario, a corporation that carries on business in Ontario, or a trade union that holds bargaining rights for employees in Ontario. Groups like associations or clubs that are not incorporated may not register as third-party advertisers. In a lot of the cottage country, country areas where there are uh, lake associations that are un, not incorporated, they would not be able to be third party advertisers. Next slide, please. Third party advertiser eligibility in eligibility. A third party advertiser is an individual, a corporation or a trade union that is registered um, in a municipality to promote, support or oppose a candidate or a yes, no answer to a question on the ballot. Third party advertise, a third party advertisement means an advertisement in any broadcast, print, electronic or other median that has the purpose of promoting or supporting or opposing a candidate or a yes, no on a ballot question. The meaning of third party in this context means that a person or an entity who is not a candidate, but is still entitled to advocating related to a municipal election. Activities that do not involve spending money, such as discussions or expressions of opinion about a candidate are not considered to be third party advertising. Examples might be sitting around speaking to neighbors or friends, posting on your social media, such as Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or sending an email to a group or mailing list. Advertising about an issue rather than a candidate or a yes, no answer to a question is not considered third party advertising. For, for example, signs saying I support local business or keep the waterfront green, green would not be third party, party advertising, even if a candidate has made those issues part of their campaign. Next slide, please. Nomination process. The first day for filing nominations is May 1st, 2022 for candidates and third party advertisers. Note, and, and again, I think we all know that it was a Sunday and, and you had to come in on a Monday. <laughs> the last day and time for filing nominations for the 2022 election is Friday, August 19th by 2 p.m. And I want you to note that, um, you know, people often assume that it is the end of business day. There are another, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, deadlines in the Municipal Elections Act that do end at 2 p.m. So you do have to pay a little bit of attention to that. Um, nomination day. This is the last day you may file or withdraw. And in 2022, as we just said, is August 19th, 2022. If a candidate withdraws a nomination, they are still required to file a campaign financial statement covering the finance transactions made in the campaign. If they've not spent any money or raised any funds, then there is a box that you can click 
and sign the form and that's as much as you need to do. But that is absolutely if you've not raised or spent anything. If a nomination is withdrawn, the candidate is entitled to a refund of their nomination filing fee only after they've filed their financial statements by the required deadline. Um, the candidate guide has several examples um, that may fit your situation if you do withdraw or if you do choose to run for a different um, office. So again, I'm referring you back to that candid candidate's guide. It has a little bit more detail, a little bit more, more samples and examples. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Nomination process continued on May 1st until 2, until 2 p.m. Uh, sorry, May 1st until 2 p.m. on August 19th, 2022. Nominations can be submitted to the clerk from anyone who meets the eligibility criteria to run. To file, candidates must complete a Form 1 nomination paper and submit it to the clerk along with the app applicable nomination filing fee. The filing fee is $200 for anyone running for the head of council and $100 for those running for other offices. Clerks must be satisfied that you are eligible to run in order to certify your nomination. The clerk can ask you to show identification or fill out additional forms to prove that you are eligible to run for that office. The nomination form must have an original signature. If the nomination is not certified by the clerk, your name will not appear on the ballot. If there is a ward system, um, if you are eligible to vote in the municipality, you may run in any ward. If you do not run in a um, if you do not run in the ward where you live, you will not be able to vote for yourself as you must vote in the, uh, the ward in which you reside. In addition to the legislative requirements, each municipal clerk may establish their own local processes and procedures related to submitting nominations. So it's really important to uh, contact the clerk so that you understand the process in the municipality. Next slide, please. Nomination process, 25 signature requirement. Municipal council candidates are required to obtain 25 nomination signatures on form two, unless a municipality has less than 4,000 electors. The requirement for nominators to sign a nomination form does not apply to school board candidates. <clears throat> Nominators can nominate more than one candidate and are not required to vote for that candidate. Nominators must meet the eligibility requirements of a municipal elector at the time they sign the nomination form. In a ward system, the nominator can be anyone who's eligible to vote in the municipality, not just the ward. Both the clerk and the candidate are entitled to rely on the information provided by the nominator. If the nominator did not meet the eligibility requirement when they signed the document, they could be held accountable and, and under, penalty section, under the penalty section of the Municipal Elections Act. Candidates should remember that even if electronic filing is permitted, they are required to obtain 25 original signatures endorsing their nomination where applicable and keep those until 2026. We'll talk a little bit about keeping records a little later. Um, one of the things that we have found is uh, there are people who will show up with their 25 signatures and there may be one or two that, the, um, that don't appear to be able to um, meet the requirements. So therefore the candidate has to go back out and get more signatures. One of the things that you could do as a best practice is take more than 25 signatures. Um, and then if some of your signatures drop off, you've still got some others to rely on. And again, that's just a best, best practice. It's not in the Municipal Act and not required. Next slide, please. Running for a different office. Occasionally a candidate changes their mind and decides to run for a different office. You can run for only one office at any time. If a candidate files a second nomination, the first nomination is deemed withdrawn. 
If a candidate decides to run for another office and they have already collected the 25 endorsement signatures, they can use these endorsements for the other office. If a candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board, and both positions are elected at large, everything from the first campaign may be transferred to the second campaign, and only one financial statement will need to be filed. Conversely, if a candidate decides to run for a different office on the same council or school board, and one or both is elected by ward, two campaigns, the two campaigns must be kept separate and there must be two financial statements filed. And again, there are a lot more examples in the candidate's guide for you related to this. Next slide, please. Registration of third-party advertisers. Individuals, corporations, and trade unions may register to be third-party advertiser. There is no registration fee for a third-party advertiser. The third-party advertiser would, re would register with the clerk at a local municipality using the prescribed form and must include a declaration of qualifications signed by the individual or representative of the corporation or the trade union. Once registered, the third-party advertiser may advertise in support or opposition to any candidate being elected by voters in that municipality. That would include council, trustees, um, and directly elected upper tier candidates. For, uh, for a regular election, the registration cannot be filed earlier than the first day for filing nominations and cannot be filed later than the Friday before voting day during the regular clerk's office hours. Once the clerk certifies the notice of registration, the individual corporation or trade union is a registered third party advertiser. Third party advertising is geographically based and is structured around the concept of influencing a specific set of voters in a specific location or geography. So for example, uh, if somebody, somebody could reg if somebody wanted to influence voters in Oakville, they would register in Oakville. Uh, registering in the municipality where the third party advertiser hopes to influence votes allows flexibility to support or advocate against um, any candidate in that specific geography. If an individual wants to influence voters in more than one municipality or geography, uh, for example, over three municipalities, um, he or she would need to register in each of the three municipalities and conduct their activities as three separate campaigns. Um, next slide, please. Registration of third-party advertisers continue, continued. Third-party advertising withdrawal. If a third-party advertiser wants to change their mind and run for a municipal candidate position, the third-party advertiser's registration will be deemed withdrawn. This means that their advertising campaign would automatically end and they would um, when they file their nomination. If a corporation or trade union is registered as a third-party advertiser, it would not be affected by a person, an individual um, from that corporation or trade union filing a candidate nomination as the person would be a become a separate entity. The third-party advertiser and the candidate would need to be careful to distance their activities. The existing campaign finance rules would not change in the following circumstances. Finances or funds raised related to a third party advertising campaign cannot be transferred to a candidate's campaign. A third party advertiser who withdraws and closes their campaign cannot transfer that can campaign to someone else. So if it is in the, the name of Bob Smith and they want to not do it anymore, they can't take those funds and give them to Sally Smith. Um, it has to stay with the original registered person. To maintain financial um, transparency around third-party advertising campaigns, the financial statements of the advertisers who end their campaigns early should reflect their finances as of the day their campaign ended. Uh, next slide, please. Contributions. 
Campaign accounts are only required if the candidate or your third party advertiser raises or spends money. So for acclamations or for campaigns where no funds are raised or spent, there's no need for a campaign account. Um, all other uh, folks who are going to raise or spend money must open a campaign account. Uh, trade unions and corporations are not eligible to contribute to candidates' campaigns, although they can participate in the election as a third party advertiser. Municipalities must establish rules and procedures regarding the use of municipal or local board resources during the campaign period. This will encourage accountability and transparency and somewhat level the playing field with regard to incumbents. These rules must be passed and put in place by May 1st in the year of the election. The practice of municipalities providing candidates information on their website is not a contribution or prohibited. So just a little tip here, if you're going to run and raise and spend money, the first thing you should do following filing your nomination is go to the bank and open a bank account exclusively for your campaign. Do not use a personal account. Um, if you want, you can call me and I can tell you nightmare stories about people who did use personal accounts. Next slide, please. Contributions continued. Candidates can accept contributions from individuals who are normally uh, resident in Ontario and the candidate and their spouse. Contributions from the candidate and their spouse are considered to have come from the same person and count against the self-contribution limit. Third party advertisers may accept contributions from in individuals normally residing in Ontario trade unions that hold bargaining rights for employees and Ontario, and in Ontario and corporations that care, carry on business in Ontario. And just to talk a little bit about what is a corporation, corporations are deemed to be a single corporation if one of the corporations controls the others directly or indirectly, or if all of the corporations are owned or controlled by the same person or group of persons, either directly or indirectly. Next slide, please. Contributions. Um, I'm gonna ask you to review this slide on your own to understand um, candidate and third party, uh, what third party advertisers cannot uh, accept, sorry, they cannot accept con these contributions from these people. Uh, sorry, sometimes I get tongue tied. Uh, candidates and third party adver advertisers are obligated to inform contributors of their contribution limits. You may wish to create a spreadsheet or a chart to track contributions using your receipts issued. This may assist you in alerting contributors who are close to the limits. Unfortunately, you are only going to be able to track the contributions to your campaign um, and alert them if they are getting, if they are uh, contributing high to your campaign. You will not know or be able to track what they're contributing to others. But um, it is a good practice. Um, it also shows your due diligence to want to follow the legislation. Another tip about volunteers. The value of services provided by a volunteer is generally not considered to be a contribution. So, um, you know, people who are helping you hand out flyers or put in signs or maybe flipping burgers at a barbecue, um, they're volunteers. If a professional volunteers to provide you services for which they are normally paid, so example, an accountant, a lawyer, a photographer, the market value of the service must be recorded as a contribution by the volunteer and as a campaign expense and a receipt issued. Next slide, please. Campaign contributions are money, goods or services given to a candidate for his or her election campaign. Fundraising functions are events or activities held by or in behalf of the candidate for the primary purpose of raising money for the candidate's campaign. 
The price of admission of a fundraising function is a campaign donation and a receipt must be issued for the full amount. No anonymous contributions are permitted except for a pass the hat at a fundraising function. Passing the hat, pass the hat donations that are under $25 may be given anonymously and you do not have to issue a receipt. This is, uh, uh, this is considered campaign income and not considered to be a contribution and the total amount received must be reported as such on the campaign financial statement. And I will let you know, we'll, um, I know Bridget will talk more about this, but there uh, for um, candidates, you have what's called a form four and third party advertisers, you have what's called a form eight. And these are your financial forms. And I would also recommend that you look at these because for example, it has um, the form four for candidates has a dedicated section related to fundraising functions and so we'll help you learn up what you can do and what you can't do. Outside of a fundraising function, cash contributions may only be accepted up to $25 and it must be receipted. So therefore it is no longer anonymous. Contributions over $100, so $100 and one penny, you must have name, address, how the money came in, um, the amount, and this will become part of the public document, the form four. Um, anything under $100 and one cent um, will not be publicly reported. It will be an aggregate. So that's something that you need to keep in mind and probably tell people who are making those types of donations. Contrib contributions more than $25 must be made by check, money order, or a method that clearly shows where the funds came from. Receipts must be issued for every contribution and they should contain name, address of the contributor, the amount and the date. And I would also recommend the format in which the money came in. These receipts cannot be used for provincial or federal income tax. Next slide, please. Contribution limits. The limit for contributions to any one candidate or registered third party advertiser is $1,200. The individual contribution amount was increased um, during this election period from $750 to $1,200. However, the aggregate amount of $5,000 is still the same. To reinforce, a candidate and a third party advertiser um, are required to inform contributors of these contribution limits, $1,200 um, uh, individually and $500 in an aggregate uh, situation. Uh, contributors may fails, face penalties if um, under the Municipal Elections Act if they exceed these limits. Um, once the financial filing deadline passes, the municipal clerk is required to refuse, review submissions with a specific focus on contributors. If it appears a contributor has exceeded one or more of their limits, the clerk must report this to the Compliance Audit Committee, and that committee will decide whether to proceed with legal action. And again, I'm, I'm giving you little tidbits of things that Bridget's going to cover um, in much more depth in the second half. Um, one of the things that you may do is consider identifying on the bottom of your receipts those contribution limits. Um, when you receive a contribution from a joint account check, you must determine which of the jointed parties are making the contribution for receiving purposes. Um, so for example, if Bob and Sally have um, a joint check and the check comes in and it's signed by Bob, you're probably thinking Bob's making that contribution, but you want to double check because whoever is making the contribution is the person that gets the receipt. If Bob and Sally both want to make a contribution and they're doing it on their joint checks, then again, you're going to need to verify, you know, which one is which and maybe even ask them to put it in the notation section. You're required to return any contributions that um, have been made or accepted in contravention of the Municipal Elections Act as soon as you learn that it was an ineligible contribution. If you cannot return the contribution, you must turn it over to the municipal clerk as soon as you learn you are unable to return it. For more information, you can find this in the guides. 
Um, this comes up uh, occasionally in the Niagara region where there are a lot of um, American cottagers and they choose to make contributions to campaigns and they can't. Next slide. Self-funding limit, or what I say is, how much money can my spouse and I give to my campaign? The self-funding limit for municipal council candidates is based on the number of electors voting for the office to a maximum of $25,000 per candidate. This limit also applies to contributions made by the candidate's spouse. The formula for calculating the limit is $7,500 plus 20 cents per elector for head of council, um, and uh, $5,000 plus 20 cents per elector for council offices. The highest self-funding limit that anybody poss possibly can have is $12,000. There is no self-funding limit for school board candidates or third-party advertisers. Next slide, please. Borrowing. Loans can only be borrowed from a bank or an other recognized lending institution in Ontario and must be directed immediately into the campaign account. Loans may only be guaranteed by the candidate or their spouse. While candidates can open their account with their own funds, um, the candidate cannot loan funds to his or her campaign to kickstart it with the intention of getting it back. Um, again, Bridget will talk a little bit more at the end with regard to surplus, surpluses, um, which are a little bit different. The only way that a candidate can reclaim this startup um, amount is after the election campaign is, is ended and prior to filing their financial statements, and the candidate and his or her spouse may be refunded um, any contributions from that surplus. You can't receive a loan from family members or from any corporate accounts that you may have access to. The loan isn't considered to be, a, to be campaign income and paid back, excuse me, the loan isn't considered to be campaign income and paying it back is not a campaign expense. But if you or your spouse guarantee the loan and the campaign does not repay all of it, the remaining balance is a contribution since the guarantor is basically providing the campaign the means to repay the loan. And when we say guarantor, we're talking the spouse or the candidate. So keep in mind the self-funding limit for the candidate and the spouse if you borrow money and end up in this situation. You could end up um, you know, going exceeding your self-spending limit. Any interest um, that the campaign pays on the loan is uh, a campaign expense. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Bridget. Okay. Um, okay, so campaign and expenses. Candidates and third party advertisers should familiarize themselves with campaign expense provisions and know what constitutes an expense under the spending limits. These can be found in the candidate's guide. Campaign expenses are costs that are incurred by the candidate or a person under the candidate's direction, such as a campaign manager, along with a third party advertiser in their campaign. The nomination fee is a personal expense and is not a campaign expense. Therefore, it should not be reported on your financial statements. All expenses must be paid from your campaign bank account and a receipt must be retained that shows what the expense was for. If, we, if you are using a credit card to pay for purchases, you should make sure you keep clear records showing that the expense in the credit card was reimbursed from the campaign account. Candidates are subject to two spending limits, a general spending limit and a separate limit for expenses relating to parties and expressions of appreciation after voting day. The spending limit relates to parties and appreciation shall not be greater than 10% of the total spending limit that is provided to you. Some expenses are not subject to the general spending limit, such as audit and accounting fees, expenses relating to a recount and compliance audit, and expenses relating to holding a fundraising event or activity. Next slide, please. Um, campaign, again, campaign expenses. Goods and services donated to the campaign are also expenses and must be reported. A receipt must be provided for fair market value and treated as a contribution. With respect to campaign inventory, if you ran in the last election and want to use leftover goods such as signs or office supplies, 
you have to determine the current market value for those goods and record them as an expense in the current campaign. Also, if you end up with leftover inventory at the end of this campaign, it becomes your personal property. But if you want to store them in to use in another election, any costs for storage are not considered campaign expenses. Next slide, please. Spending limits. The spending limit formula for candidates and maximum amount for parties after voting day are set out in Ontario Regulation 101.97. The clerk calculates the spending limits twice. The first time upon a candidate filing the nomination form, the clerk will calculate the spending limit based on the number of electors on the voters list as it existed on September 15th, 2018. The second time, the calculation is based on the number of electors on the voters list as it exists on September 15th, 2022. And, and the clerk will provide the second um, calculation on or before September 25th, 2022. Whichever number is higher is, is the spending limit and the clerk's calculation is final. Next slide, please. Candidates will be required to inform their contributors of the contribution limits. For example, how much a contributor can contribute to an individual candidate's campaign, as Diane mentioned before, being $1,200 and the aggregate, aggregate limit on contributions to any one council or local board election being $5,000. Again, the final spending limit will be provided to candidates by September 25th. If a third party advertiser has registered in more than one municipality, each registration is a separate campaign with its own spending limits. If there is a joint purchase spanning over more than one municipality, then portion a reasonable amount for each registration. The campaign finance rules are generally the same for third party advertisers as they are for candidates. This includes filing financial, this includes financial filing requirements, requests for extensions and records. Third party advertisers are also required to ensure contributions and expenses are tracked and accounted for, proper record retention, proper direction is provided to those incurring expenses or accepting contributions on their behalf and that spending limits are adhered to. Next slide, please. Expenses not subject to the spending limits. Most expenses are subject to the spending limit. Those listed in the slide are not. For example, again, expenses related to a recount or to a compliance audit. Expenses related to fundraising functions are exempt from the campaign spending limit as well, but in order to qualify as a fundraising function, an event must have the raising of money as its primary purpose. Campaign events at which incidental fundraising takes place do not qualify as fundraising functions. Similarly, a brochure promoting awareness of a candidate that contains contact information to make com campaign contributions does not qualify as a fundraising function. Expenses that were subject to the spending limit if incurred before voting day are not subject to the spending limit if incurred after voting day. For example, expenses related to a compliance audit, a court action for controverted election, expenses incurred after voting day. Next slide, please. Third party advertiser spending limits. So third party advertisers will be subject to two spending limits as well, a general spending limit and a separate limit for expenses related to parties and expressions of appreciation after the close of voting. The Municipal Elections Act also provides that the spending limit for parties and other expressions of appreciation after voting day be set at 10% of the general spending limit that was provided to you. This would be consistent with the spending limit in place for candidates. Next slide, please. Campaign finance rules. As a candidate or a third party advertiser, it is important that you be fully aware of the responsibilities regarding the election spending and accepting campaign contributions. The candidate's guide is a good resource, as well as sections 88.8 .8 to 88.21 of the Municipal Elections Act. And be familiar with financial statements that you will be required to complete at the end of your campaign period. This will help guide you in organizing your records and how they have to be reported. A question we are asked each municipal elections is whether there is a requirement for e every candidate to have a chief financial officer. And the answer is no, you are not required. 
you are required under the Municipal Elections Act to keep accurate records and open a campaign account if you are spending any money or accepting any contributions. Again, as Diane mentioned before, a bank account is not required if candidate or third party advertisers do not receive or spend any money. Next slide, please. Candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep complete and accurate financial statements during the course of their campaigns. All contributions and expenses are to be accounted for and disclosed by the candidate on the relevant prescribed financial form. All candidates and third party advertisers are required to keep all original campaign financial records until after November 15th, 2026, when a new council takes office. These rules apply whether you are elected or not. Next slide, please. So store your receipts in a secure place as they are valuable documents and they may be needed, they be need to be produced in the event of a compliance audit. Receipts must be signed by the candidate or his or her designate. It is good practice to have a receipt that is multi-part form, one for the contributor and one or more for the candidate's records. Receipts should be numbered in sequence and open a bank account which provides monthly statements and canceled checks. Produce duplicate deposit slips for every deposit, listing the names of the contributors and the amounts received from each. Ensure a very good record is kept of all contributions as sometimes a contributor makes numerous contributions and may reach the $100 limit where they need to be identified within the financial statement. Maintain a petty cash fund to handle minor expenses and obtain invoices to support all payments from the fund. At any time, the cash on hand plus the total amount of invoices should equal the original amount of the petty cash fund. The fund can be replenished periodically by a check drawn on the campaign account in an amount equal to the total amount of the invoices. Candidates and third party advertisers may find it useful to look over again the financial statements being form four for candidates and form eight for third party advertisers respectively at the beginning of their campaign to give them an idea of what information will be needed to report at the end of the campaign. Requirement under the Municipal Elections Act states you must maintain original records again until November 15th, 2026. Next slide, please. Campaign advertisements. First off, it is recommended for candidates to contact a municipality, both upper and lower, to ask about bylaws relating to signs and campaigning. The period for third party advertisements, as shown on the slide, is a period when the rules for third party advertisers applies. In 2022, that started May 1st until the close of voting at 8 p.m. on October 24th, 2022. Third party advertisers and candidates are required to identify themselves on all signs and advertisements. The Municipal Elections Act references for advertising is for candidates, section 88.3, and for third party advertisers, section 88.4. Next slide, please. Campaign advertisements continued. The broadcaster or publisher of a third party or candidate advertisement shall maintain records containing the following information for a period of four years for the public to inspect. Name of the candidate or third party or registered third party advertiser, the name, business address, and telephone number of the individual who deals with the broadcaster or publisher under the direction of the candidate or third party advertiser, copy of the advertisement or the means of reproducing it for inspection, and a statement of the charge made for its appearance. Next slide, please. Financial statement. So section 88.25 of the Municipal Elections Act states all candidates are required to file form four with the clerk regardless of how much or how little they spent or fundraise. If you file denomination form, you must file a form four. This form is required even if you withdrew your nomination or were claimed. If you registered as a third party advertiser, you must complete the form eight. A candidate may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline of March 31st. The clerk is required to make, a pub make public a report that states which candidates filed financial statements and which did not. Next slide, please. 
The appointment of an auditor by the candidate is mandatory if expenses or contributions exceed $10,000. The auditor must be licensed under the Public Accounting Act 2004. Note that campaign statements are public documents and anyone contributing $100 or more will be identified on the financial statement that will be made public. So as I mentioned before, it is it's a good idea to mention to anyone contributing that they will be, their names will be made public. Next slide, please. Candidates can file their financial documents at any time after voting day to January 3rd. Filing the financial statement ends the campaign period. This will make it easier for acclamations and campaigns where little or no expense is incurred. Clerks will be required to report again whether candidates have met their financial filing obligation and publish that report on the MISA website or in another electronic form. This needs to be done by April 30th, 2023 in the case of a regular election or 90 days or within 90 days of a by-election. Next slide, please. The nomination fee is only refundable if the financial statement is filed on time. A candidate or third party advertiser who misses the filing deadline may file within the 30 day grace period following the deadline, provided a $500 late fee, filing fee is paid to the municipality. So just note, a candidate who chooses to file within this 30 day grace period will be subject to both the $500 late filing fee, as well as the loss of their nomination refund. A candidate or third party advertiser may resubmit a financial statement to correct an error up until the filing deadline of March 31st, 2023. Next slide, please. Surplus. When filing the financial statement, a candidate or third party advertiser with a campaign surplus must pay the entire amount to the clerk. Prior to paying over any surplus funds to the clerk, a candidate or third party advertiser is entitled to a refund of any contributions they or their spouse has made to the campaign, but not anyone else. The amount that may be refunded is the lesser of the amount of the relevant contribution or the amount of the surplus. For example, if there was a surplus of $500 and the total contributions made by the candidate was $400, the candidate would be entitled to the $400 they contributed and the remaining $100 would be given to the clerk of the municipality. The clerk is required to place surplus monies in trust for use by the candidate or third party advertiser if they need it for a compliance audit. If neither the candidate nor third party advertiser requires the funds for these purposes, it becomes the property of the municipality or the school board. Next slide, please. Compliance audit. So every council and school board must establish a compliance audit committee. Members of a compliance audit committee cannot be members of the council or school board, an employee, a candidate in the election, or a registered third party advertiser. Clerk is to review the contributions and to prepare a report for consideration by the Compliance Audit Committee if a contributor appears to have exceeded any contribution limits. This process is related to reviewing contributions as reported on the financial statements and is not connected to the Compliance Audit process. If it is apparent to the clerk that a contributor has exceeded one or more of the contribution limits, the clerk would report this to the committee, which would meet to determine whether to proceed with legal action. The legislation does not specify what details are to be provided in a report to the committee. Electors entitled to vote in election may apply for a compliance audit even if the candidate has not filed a financial statement. The application must be in writing and set out the electors reasons for why they believe the Municipal Elections Act has been contravened. The application must be submitted to the municipal clerk or the secretary of the school board within 90 days of the filing deadline. The Compliance Audit Committee will consider the application and decide whether to retain an auditor to undertake a compliance audit of the candidate's financial return. Next slide, please. The Compliance Audit Committee is required to provide brief written reasons for its decision. Compliance Audit Committee meetings are required to be open to the public, but the committee may deliberate in private. Electors can apply for a compliance audit of a third party advertiser's campaign finances as well. The minister has the authority to make a regulation setting out qualifications for the compliance audit committee members. 
The written reasons for the committee's decision shall be given to the candidate, the clerk with whom the candidate filed his or her nomination, the secretary of the local school board, if applicable, and the, and the applicant. If an audit occurs, a report must be circulated to the same individuals. The campaign audit committee considers the auditor's report. If the compliance audit determines there has been an apparent contravention of the Municipal Elections Act, the committee will decide whether to proceed with legal action. Decisions of the committee may be appealed to the Superior Court of Justice. A person who believes that a candidate has contravened the Municipal Elections Act may proceed with legal action without having first obtained a compliance audit. Next slide, please. Offenses. An offense as described in section 90, subsection three, defines a corrupt practice and a person who commits it on, on conviction disqualified from voting at an election until the next regular election has taken place after the election to at which the offense relates, in addition to being liable to any other penalty provided for in the act. Next slide, please. Penalties. In general, the penalties listed in this slide are available to the courts upon conviction for an offense under the Municipal Elections Act. Just to notice, ineligibility to vote is a penalty if you are convicted of a corrupt practice. And that is cited in section 90 of the Municipal Elections Act. Next slide, please. Voters list. Section 23 states the clerk shall not provide a copy of the voters list under subsection three or a part of the voters list under subsection four until September 1st. Next slide, please. Candidates running in a ward are entitled only to that portion of the list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote for that office. If asked on written request, the clerk shall provide a copy of the voters list to the secretary of the school board, the clerk of the municipality responsible for conducting the school board elections for the area, upper tier clerk if members are required to be elected at an election conducted by the clerk or that has submitted a bylaw or question to the electors, the minister of municipal affairs and housing if the minister has submitted a question to the electors, which is very rare. Candidates can only receive part of the voters list that contains the names of the electors entitled to vote in that office. For example, if there are wards, again, the ward candidate would be entitled only to that ward portion of the voters list. Next slide, please. The clerk may require the, may require anyone that has received a copy of the voters list to sign a receipt acknowledging the list is only to be used for election purposes and any other use would be in violation of the Municipal Elections Act. In a word, again, just a, just a reminder, in a word system, electors entitled to vote to earn this in a word system, an elector is entitled to vote only in the ward where he or she resides. And I think I mentioned that earlier. Next slide, please. So voting proxy. There are a number of reasons why someone would appoint someone else to vote on their behalf, including an absence from the area, an illness, etc. No appointments for proxies are made until all the nominations are closed, which is after August 19th. Assignment of proxy vote is the responsibility of an eligible voter to appoint an identified eligible voter. Eligible proxy may exercise only one proxy vote unless the proxy is acting on behalf of a spouse, sibling, parent, child, grandparent, or grandchild. This is referenced in section 44, two and three of the Municipal Elections Act. Proxy forms must have original signatures. Please check with the municipal clerk if proxy voting is available as municipalities that use alternate voting may not permit proxy voting. Next slide, please. Scrutineers. Only a candidate may appoint scrutineers to represent him or her during the voting and the counting of votes, including during a recount. Third party advertisers cannot appoint scrutineers. In the traditional election where voting takes place at a poll, the deputy returning officer is in charge of the activity in the voting place and the deputy returning officer may ask the scrutineer to leave if the scrutineer is not complying with the legislation. Candidates or scrutineers should respect that the deputy returning officer must ensure fairness, access, privacy, and security of the vote at absolutely no campaigning within the voting place. 
This means scrutineers cannot enter the voting place wearing a pin or shirt or any reference to candidates. A useful tip would be to check with the clerk to see if a list of scrutineers rights is being given to election staff at the poll. If so, use that list or prepare your own and hand out to each of your scrutineers a list of their rights, which are spelled out in section 47.5 of the, the Municipal Elections Act. There are no age restrictions for scrutineers. Next slide, please. Recounts. A recount is automatic if the vote is tied. Councils and school boards have the option of establishing policies prior to the election that also allow for an automatic recount. Council still retains the option to pass a resolution for a recount within 30 days after the clerk has declared the results of the election. An eligible elector can apply to the courts for a recount within 30 days of the clerk's declaration of the results. Next slide, please. So these are some key dates. So voting date is Monday, October 24th, 2022, between 10 a.m. and 8, between 10 a.m. and 8 p.m. The campaign period, the time when a candidate can accept contributions and incur election expenses, runs from the date the nomination is submitted to the clerk up until January 3rd, 2023. The campaign period, again, the time the third party advertiser can ex incur expenses, begins on the date their registration is certified. Earliest was May 1st until January 3rd, 2023. The deadline for filing of the campaign financial expenses in the clerk's office is Friday, March 31st, 2023, no later than 2 p.m. All candidates and third party advertisers must file this statement regardless again of how much they spent or received in contributions. Next slide, please. Resources. This lists the resources that are available to you in order to, be, to prepare you for your campaign. The first section of links will take you to the ELAWS website where all provincial legislation is available online, including the associated regulations. You will be very familiar with the Municipal Elections Act, the Municipal Act, the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act, and if running for a school board, the Education Act. The second link is to the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing website. From this site, you will be able to access the 2022 Voters Guide, Candidates Guide, and the Third Party Advertisers Guide, which are great resources to prepare you. The next one is, is the Municipal World website, which you will find a list of books that will assist you in your campaign. Next slide, please. And here we are, we are done our presentation and this is the time if anyone has any questions. Thank you so much, uh, Bridget and Diane for that presentation. So I don't see any hands up, um, but we do have one question that came in through the Q&A chat. Um, and I do think this is something that I think uh, Vicki Titanic Town Clerk will, will address. Uh, the question is, does council have the right to screen complaints by residents relating to conflict of interest and breaches of the council code of conduct? Good evening, everyone. Um, I think the easiest uh, answer to that is that all complaints that we receive regarding uh, complaints from our residents on code of conduct and conflict of interest are received by our integrity commissioner. And uh, they are responsible for investigating all of those complaints received in an independent manner. That's it. Thank you, Vicki. Uh, so there's no further questions. Um, again, we always add, we do invite the participants in tonight's session to, uh, to reach out to us if you do have questions. And I'm just going to share my screen once more just for a final slide. And uh, thank you again to Diane and Bridget uh, for that great presentation. Um, so Oakville will be hosting uh, another candidate information session on August 11th. At this session, we will be focusing on uh, location information specific to Oakville's advanced voting and uh, on voting day, uh, candidate and scrutiny conduct on voting locations, elections, election sign information, campaign finance details, and results reporting. 
So as uh, the ministry reps did mention, nominations close at 2 p.m. on Friday, August 19th. This is the last day an individual can file a nomination for office or withdraw a nomination. Advanced voting will take place at multiple locations during the period of October 6th to 9th and October 11th to the 15th. And of course, voting day is Monday, October 24th. All voting locations will be physically accessible and all voting locations will be open from 10 a.m. until 8 p.m. Uh, and for the elected candidates, the new term of council begins on November 15th, 2022 and runs through until November 14th to 2026. Sorry, November 14th, 2026. Uh, the inaugural council meeting for the town of Oakville will take place on Monday, November 21st, 2022. And I do believe one other additional question just came in. So the question is, does the candidate have to hire third party advertising? If the candidate uh, advertises by its own, uh, does it still need to, does it still need registration? So I will turn to Diane and Bridget if, yep. if one of you wish to address it. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for the question. The uh, first thing that I, sorry. <laughs> Sorry, somebody just knocked on my door. This is the problem with being at home. <laughs> okay, I think I can do this now. My apologies. <laughs> I think. Oh, no. <laughs> Hold on. Bridget, can you answer this? Okay. I have to go. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay. yeah. Okay. So the question is, if if they if they hire a third party advertiser, so you don't hire a third party advertiser, but um, so you don't you don't necessarily have a third party advertiser. You can do your own campaign. Is if somebody registers as a third party advertiser, um, but there is yeah, you don't appoint or hire a third party advertiser. So I think that answers the question. Yeah, and Bridget, maybe you can just add as well that, um, or, or you can comment on this that mm -hmm. uh, you don't actually you don't actually solicit or ask anyone to be a third party advertiser on your behalf. Right, right. They have to initiate themselves, and they have to register, and they have lots of responsibilities as a third party advertiser. Yes, but you can do your own campaigning. Um, as we mentioned throughout the slide, there's um, a candidate can do lots of campaigning themselves. Diane, did you want to add anything? No, no, that's great. <laughs> yeah, so I, I didn't, I do apologize. Um, I, again, I think Bridget's probably said it. You don't, the third party advertiser and the candidate need to keep as far apart as possible. Um, your responsible, responsibilities of a can, as a candidate are to manage your own campaign. So I'm sure Bridget said the same thing. <laughs> Thanks, Diane. Uh, so I don't actually see any other uh, questions. Um, so uh, again, a, a tremendous thank you uh, to our speakers tonight. So Senator Clement, thank you for your inspiring story and motivation that you shared with everybody. Uh, and to our ministry reps, Diane and Bridget, thank you so much for attending. A lot of information was thrown everybody at uh, everybody uh, tonight, but it's all necessary. Um, and we are all here to support you as uh, you digest some of the information and there's lots of resources available for you. And thank, uh, thank you to all of those who attended tonight. I thank you and applaud you uh, for your engagement uh, with the community. And on that note, I wish everybody a great evening. Thank you and goodbye. Bye, <laughs> good luck everyone. Thank you.